Hello, welcome back to Franklin Covey's On Leadership podcast series, the largest weekly leadership podcast globally. I'm privileged to serve as your weekly host and interviewer. As you may know, I'm the recent author of the book, Master Mentors, number one Amazon best-selling book based on 30 of our favorite On Leadership guests where I share a different transformational insight from each of them. Pick up a copy, easy breezy to read. I've just finished the second volume in the 10-volume series from HarperCollins with 30 new mentors and 30 new insights on my way to the third volume, which perhaps today's guest might choose to make an appearance in the third volume. In fact, let me tell you, today's guest is a remarkable individual. Now, I have no credibility when it comes to recommending movies. My favorite movie is Austin Powers, which of course makes me both a fun but horrible parent to my three young boys. But when it comes to recommending books, I've got some cred. Look behind me, read a few thousand, written a few myself, and two of my favorite books in the past year are Everyday Hero Manifesto from Robin Sharma. You know him as a previous guest. He, of course, is the author who wrote the book, The Monk Who Sold His Ferrari, life-changing book from Robin Sharma. Today's guest has my second favorite book written in the last year, releasing today. Illogical, saying yes to a life without limits by Emmanuel Acho. Emmanuel, welcome back to On Leadership. God, thanks for having me back, man. It's uh, it's an honor, it's a pleasure, and I could not be more eager to dive into some of these life-changing concepts. Well, they're just that. Your book is is no hyperbole, is life-changing. You were gracious enough just shy of a year ago, Emmanuel, to join us when you had recently launched your number one New York Times bestseller, Uncomfortable Conversation with the Black Man, which, of course, you won an Emmy Award because of your, your web series as well. You went on to write the, the version, which I thought was a phenomenal um, uh, derivation, uncomfortable conversation with the black boy, really written to people like my sons to understand how to be a global citizen and recognize all, they, all the privilege they had and how they could also be a global citizen as well. Since then, you've been on the back cover of every magazine published in America. You've won an Emmy. You have a graduate degree. Will you take a few moments before we get into illogical, would you just for the last human alive that perhaps hasn't been on radio, TV, a podcast, the web, or been in a bookstore or a newsprint store or anywhere in America on television, would you talk a bit about your journey? Talk about your your. Uh, your life as a pro athlete, how you pivoted yeah. quickly to become an author and an Emmy winning um, uh, uh, host, and then we'll get into illogical. So I was drafted, Scott, into the National Football League, the NFL, in 2012, straight out of college. I finished my four years at the University of Texas, got my undergrad degree in sports management, and found myself drafted to the Cleveland Browns in the sixth round. Well, a year later, one of the most unforeseen events of my life, I was traded from the Cleveland Browns to the Philadelphia Eagles. In the NFL, when you get traded, uh, somebody on staff walks up to you, gives you that handshake and that all too familiar pat on the bat. It's been back. It's been nice knowing you. The coaches and the general manager looks at me and says, Emmanuel, you know, we'll be trading you to the Philadelphia Eagles. I'm thinking, okay, cool. When do I leave? A week, two weeks, end of the month? Your flight's in three hours. Whoa, 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 wait a second. I'm not packed. Don't worry, we'll pack for you. We'll ship your car and all your stuff. Thanks for your services. I go to Philly where I know no one. I'm now on the Philadelphia Eagles roster. It's my second year in the National Football League. I don't know where I'm gonna stay. I don't know anybody on the team and I don't know where I'm going to live. Well, thankfully, a man by the name of Nick Foles, he ends up being the Super Bowl MVP in 2018. He ends up taking me in. I lived with Nick Foles for a while. Well, in the National Football League, you get all the benefits, vested pension and annuity after four years. My fourth year in the NFL, my third year in Philly, remember I spent one year in Cleveland. So my fourth year in the NFL, I broke my thumb. I had a Bennett's fracture. I break my thumb, I'm in agonizing pain. I finished the practice. And the only reason I knew I broke my thumb is because what they teach you is, if you have a break, ice will not cool it down. So I hurt my thumb, I put an ice pack on it for an hour. After I take the ice pack off, an hour on and off, mind you. After I take the ice pack off, my thumb is still scorching hot. The next day, 
I go to get an x-rayed. After the x-ray, I go to get an MRI. Here was the most pivotal moment of my adult life in sports. I knew if my MRI dictated that I needed surgery, then it all came down to this, pins or screws. MRI dictates that I need surgery. I go into the surgeon's office. If I have to put pins in my hand, Scott, then the pins will protrude from the skin. I cannot play football. If I put screws into my thumb, then you can bandage your thumb with the screws inside of it and you still can play football. I go under the operating table, I get the anesthesia. I come to and I instantly ask the doctor, pins or screws? The doctor replies to me and the doctor says pins. At that moment in time, I realized my season essentially was over and I decided to end my NFL career after four years. An illogical decision, but I realized maybe my best days are behind me at 25 years of age. I had already been cut five times in the NFL. So I moved on to television. And within four years of television, I found myself a two-time Emmy Award winner. And I wrote a couple of New York Times best-selling books along that journey as well. And you've got a graduate degree and you're an international celebrity and you're the conscience in many ways of America. I think you've done pretty well for yourself, sir. Uh, congratulations. Emmanuel, when you were here last, we were talking about your book, Uncomfortable Conversations with a Black Man. And yeah. I think part of why America knows you well was because not just the book, but also of the series that you hosted and a role that Matthew McConaughey played. Would you give us two minutes on that? And then we'll pivot to your new book, Illogical. Yes, so after the murder of George Floyd, I knew that I had to say something. I was pacing around my house in Austin, Texas, and I didn't know what to do, but I knew I had to do. I could no longer watch black men, women be murdered by police unjustly. And so after the murder of George Floyd, I sat in an all white room. I rented a studio in Austin, Texas. I sat in an all white room and I hired a wedding videographer. I hired a wedding videographer because I had no other videographers. So I hired a wedding videographer. I got my best friend who's an Olympic gold medalist. And I said, hey, can you stand in as my producer? I sit in this chair and Scott, I answer four questions. Why are black people rioting? What is white privilege? Why can black people say the N-word, but white people can't? And Emmanuel, what about black on black crime in Chicago? I answered those four questions. Within five days, that episode, that video I released had 25 million views across social media. Mind you, I only had roughly 30,000 Instagram followers at the time, 25 million views. I get a call five days later, I pick it up. It's a no caller ID number. Acho, McConaughey speaking. I want to have a conversation. McConaughey? What, like Matthew McConaughey? Yeah, man, I want to have a conversation. I'm like, okay, I'll do episode two in four days. McConaughey responds, let's do it tomorrow. McConaughey wants to do it tomorrow. We do it tomorrow. I record episode two of Uncomfortable Conversations with a Black Man the very next day. True story. Uncomfortable Conversations with a Black Man takes place in an all-white room. Because McConaughey gave me no heads up, the studio space was all blue. I had to buy a white sheet of paper and cheat the camera to make it appear as though we were in an all-white room. Five days after the McConaughey episode, I get another no-caller ID call. It's from Oprah Winfrey. I pick up. Hi, Emmanuel. Oprah Winfrey speaking. Um, Oprah calls and says, Emmanuel, what is your intention? I say, Oprah, my intention is to change the world, and I truly believe I can. I'm currently working on writing a book. She said, books? I love books. Um, so Oprah and I partnered together to write Uncomfortable Conversations with a Black Man, Uncomfortable Conversations with a Black Boy, and then now Illogical. And in addition to that, you're a good family man. Uh, your family's ancestry is from Nigeria, and like a good relative, yeah. you attended a family wedding there recently, and something very interesting happened at this wedding. Uh, you survived a fire. Talk about that. Yeah. <laughs> well, I was in Nigeria, and, and I was in uh, the villages of Nigeria. My dad, he built his compound in the village. And while in Nigeria, I wake up at four in the morning. And mind you, let me put this in context. A village of Nigeria, dirt roads, this is in cement. Um, you can hear the, the hands waking you up in the morning 
cows and goats just meandering across the sand paved roads, nothing but luscious greenery because there isn't too much pollution because the cars aren't very frequent there. So I'm in a village of Nigeria in my compound and I wake up to screaming and shouting, Jesus, Jesus, God help us. Thick Nigerian accent screaming, calling on God. I look out my window and there is a fire, not one, but three different large flames outside of our compound. At that moment, after gathering all the data and realizing what was going on, I said, yo, I gotta help. I run downstairs, grab a bucket. There were about 50 villagers there because everybody was in town for this celebration. So there were about 50 villagers there. I run to grab a bucket. I put it on my head because buckets are heavy. I, I get to the ladder where one of the Nigerian villagers are standing, dousing the fire with the former bucket. Uh, one of the village women pours, uh, uh, um, what was it that she poured? She poured some sort of like salt solution. It was like sodium chloride. I forget what the solution was. She poured it into the water because it would help extinguish the fire. And for like three hours, we were just fighting a Nigerian fire in a village. The moral of that story, however, what people can accomplish when they work together is beyond comprehension. Because there's no place in America where you cannot at least call for a fire department. But in a Nigerian village, there is no place where you can call for a fire department. You and your loved ones are the fire department. And they say it takes a village to raise a child. Well, I can contest and speak from firsthand experience. It takes a village to keep adults alive. No one was injured or perished in this fire. No, the fire, by the grace of God, did not even traverse onto our land. It stayed behind the barrier. We built a wall, to, 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 to a mark of delineation between our property that we own and the rest of the property in the village. So not only was no one hurt, um, thankfully, no property of our own was damaged. Great to hear. Great to hear. Uh, Emmanuel, your new book out today, Illogical, saying yes to a life without limits, the premise of it is really that the sky is not the limit. Our logic is. Right. Riff on that. The greatest accomplishments in life, the greatest accomplishments in all of life come on the other side of our logic. Think about it. The cell phone, illogical to believe that you could hold something in your hand that would act as a camera, a global positioning system, and a device allowing you to communicate with people across the world. The airplane, illogical that you could get on a device and travel from Dallas, Texas to a village of Nigeria. Human accomplishments and achievements, illogical. I tell this story, May 5th, 1952, no one in history, nearly 2000 years, had run a mile in under four minutes. Scientists suggested it was literally and physically impossible but one man believed it to be possible, his name Roger Bannister. And on May 6, 1952, for the first time in the history of our world, a man ran a mile in under four minutes. Within the next two years, true story, within the next two years, 10 people ran a mile in under four minutes. And within the last 70 years, that world record time of three minutes, 59 seconds has dropped to three minutes, 43 seconds, and roughly 1,800 people have run a mile in under four minutes. Why? because one individual chose to believe the illogical. And what is logic? Logic is simply conventional wisdom. We have to stop letting conventional wisdom stand in the way of our dreams, of our calling, and of our destiny. I wanna read a passage from your book about that topic. Stop letting your beauty, your happiness, or your worth be dependent upon the convention of time. You yeah. are valuable, worthy, and beautiful. We all are. We just have to assess ourselves based on the metrics that matter most, our yeah. own. Once you realize that your standards are the only ones by which you should measure anything, then you can take full agency of your life. You can take the power back from society, which took it from you at birth. Mm. Let me add to that. Later on in that chapter, I say, stop letting insignificant people have such significance in your life. 
We had a depiction of beauty from the 1400s to the 1700s. The depiction of beauty from the 1400s to the 1700s, the idealization of beauty, fair skin, a larger forehead, pale skin, a larger forehead, dark hair, and a relatively a full figure. Think about this for a second. I, the Mona Lisa, which I have witnessed firsthand, the line, the tremendous line to look at the Mona Lisa, is a picture of a pale woman with dark hair and a relatively large forehead. Why? Because at the point in time in which that was painted, that was the depiction of beauty. Well, then, several hundreds of years later, the depiction of beauty is now a tan individual with blonde hair and a super unattainable skinny waist and a busty chest. See, we all try to chase the constantly evasive definitions of beauty, and I'm simply talking about beauty. Imagine uh, 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 dressing standards. If you go back and look at how we used to dress, super baggy suits were in, but now super tailored European style suits are in. Why are we talking about beauty and suits? For this reason, we let other people's definitions of beauty, other people's definitions of success, other people's definitions of significance dictate our own metrics of beauty, success, and significance. We ultimately let insignificant people play significant roles in our lives. The only metric by which we should measure success is our own metric. Scott, I'll give it to you like this, and this truly blew my mind when I thought about it. The two greatest basketball players of all time, Michael Jordan, LeBron James. Michael Jordan, he's arguably the greatest basketball player of all time because he won six NBA titles. He finished in six, he finished in first place six times. LeBron James, the biggest argument for him to not be the greatest, he only has four NBA titles. So he finished in first place four times, but LeBron James finished in second place, losing the NBA title six times. So let me summarize this. Michael Jordan finished in first place six times, but never finished in second place. LeBron James finished in first place four times, but has finished in second place six times. For that reason, Michael Jordan is greater than LeBron James, many would say. However, the same sport of basketball, based upon a different metric scale of the Olympics, many would submit that LeBron James is greater. Because four gold medals and six silver medals are weighed at a higher scale than six gold medals alone. So why do I bring that up? Because of a metric system of the NBA, we argue that Michael Jordan is better. A metric system of the Olympics, the argument would be that LeBron James is better. It is the exact same sport. So their definition of greatness is simply predicated upon what metric scale you are using. Same sport, same result, different scale. I submit it's time that we get off the scale. I submit it's time we get off of this hamster wheel because our accomplishments and our greatness in life are dictated and determined by our own metrics. Emmanuel, our co-founder, Dr. Stephen R. Covey, author of the book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, this book has sold, you know, 50 plus million copies. He would call that the social mirror. He would say that all of us are at some point beholden to the social mirror, says easy, does hard. How in your own life, you're under the public eye, you are a celebrity, you are an influencer, everything you say, literally everything you write is scrutinized. We'll talk about that in a moment on social media. How do you resist the natural gravitational pull to live your life independent of what society deems as acceptable, logical, here's how we reward and don't reward the best? I love that, I love that question. The first page of the book, the very first page of the book is blank, except it says five words. Imagine a life without limits. See, Scott, I no longer subscribe to setting goals. That's how I do it. Because in goals, you can fail. And I believe it's actually imagine a life without failure, rather. When you set a goal, you can fail. And Scott, what I did, I have to learn to stop setting goals. It is the most wild concept in all of my book based upon personal experience and others. Scott, when I wanted to go to the National Football League, I wanted to go after my third year in college. So I submitted my, my game tape to the NFL. The NFL looked at my tape and they said, Emmanuel, 
you will be drafted in the fourth to the seventh round. I wanted to be drafted in one of the first three rounds. So like any good achiever, I took that sheet of paper. I highlighted it. Emmanuel, you'll be drafted in the fourth through seventh rounds. I put it above my bed frame. Every night before I went to sleep, I looked at it. And every morning when I arose, I looked at it because you know what they say about goals. You got to write it down. You got to look at it. You got to commit it to memory. I did all those things. Well, three months before the NFL draft, I tore my quad off the bone. I ended up getting drafted in the sixth round, heartbroken, devastated, dejected. At that moment in time, I committed to stop setting goals because I said it best. A goal puts a limit on your level of achievement. And at worst, a goal will ruin your self-esteem and self-efficacy. So instead of setting goals, I now just have an objective with no limitations. What's the difference? A goal by definition is an end towards which energy is aimed. An objective is simply aiming your energy towards a direction. So rather than focusing on the end in mind, I have an objective. And when you have an objective, you can never fail. So Scott, I no longer subscribe to other people's goals. When I first got into TV, People said, oh, Emmanuel, you want to be like Michael Strahan. For those that don't know Michael Strahan, a uh, co-host of Good Morning America. I said, no, I don't want to be like Michael Strahan. Because if I set this goal to be like Michael Strahan, I just might fail. Or at best, I would be like Michael Strahan. But then I couldn't be the best version of myself. So I no longer subscribe to the box of goals that we all try to live in. Emmanuel, in that you talked about understanding failure. You write in the book, failure is simply an opportunity to try something new. Sounds yeah. like a great throwaway statement from a world-renowned celebrity and author, but let's bring that home. How in your own life have you manifested and lived the truth that failure is simply, in fact, an opportunity to try something new? Well, think about this. We praise pro athletes. We praise them. Tom Brady, Michael Jordan, LeBron James, Russell Wilson, Wayne Gretzky, Tiger Woods. But the majority of pro athletes are just trying to make it, y'all. I played for five years in the NFL. I was drafted. I was traded. And I was released five times. Excuse me, I played four years in the NFL. Drafted, traded, released five times. To put that in layman's terms, I was hired by a company. I was transferred to another company and I was fired by the company that acquired me in the transfer five times, all by the age of 25. Boy, did I fail. Now, sure, many would say, but Emmanuel, you played in the NFL. Absolutely. But after being released for the fourth time by the Philadelphia Eagles, true story, stealing street cones, big orange construction cones from the base of the Rocky Steps in Philadelphia, Stealing these construction cones, sprinting to an abandoned field littered with pigeons, using my feet to scurry the pigeons away so I could have a place to do my football drills, putting the construction cones down to do my different backpedal and sprint and backpedal drills around. That was failure, ladies and gentlemen. So I use that failure to say, you know what? Let's pivot. Let's try something new. Rather than playing in the NFL, I now enjoy life as an author, as a commentator, and as an analyst. Not only living a, dr a dream, but also making significantly more money to wear a suit as opposed to a helmet and shoulder pads. So I just view failure as an opportunity to try something new. Emmanuel, your self-disruption is quite remarkable. Like you said, I mean, your dream, your career was to be an NFL player and for a variety of perhaps serendipitous reasons that ended surprisingly abruptly. I was actually surprised to see how harsh the, the, uh, the cut process is. They handed you a black plastic bag and you cleaned your locker out and threw your things in a black garbage bag. I was surprised to hear how heartless that is. Even in corporate America, they usually, you know, give you a basket or something. But <laughs> your, your transition was very deliberate. It was illogical. It was without logical. You decided you were going to completely reinvent yourself and not take anybody's limiting paradigm to prevent you from that. You, you obviously are a wise person. You have a good group of counselors around you, but even some of those counselors occasionally have not given you helpful advice. One of the chapters in your book is about the power of earmuffs. 
And I'd like you perhaps to quickly share the metaphor, but then talk literally about when you were getting ready to write this previous book, Uncomfortable Conversations in the program, you got some, some advice that you decided to um, defer from. Yeah. Um, so don't forget your earmuffs. When you are being illogical, so many people are going to think that what you are doing is crazy. But remember, your calling is your calling. It's not a conference call. And so what the calling you have on your life, everyone will not hear. And as a result, they'll look at you like, why in the world are you doing that? Why would you break up with him? Why would you break up with her? Girl, are you really going to leave this comfortable job to go start your own business? Why would you leave this city that you and your family have lived in for your whole life to move to a completely different city you've never been in? And at some point in time, you're gonna to have to remember to put your earmuffs in and block out the noise. As I'm listening and having this conversation with you, Scott, I have these Apple AirPods in. And the beauty of the AirPod Pros, there's a transparency function where you can let a little bit of noise in, but you also have a full noise cancellation feature where you hear nothing from the outside. And we are going to have to figure out at times when it's time to fully block out the noise because our calling is our calling and it was not a conference call. For me, I had a calling on my life after the murder of George Floyd. I said, I have to come out with this video series, Uncomfortable Conversations with a Black Man. True story, I was writing the script, the um, book proposal for a logical in April of 2020. For those that recall, George Floyd was murdered in May of 2020. I started writing the logical before uncomfortable conversations with a black man was ever a thought. I had to put a logical on hold because of my calling, which was not a conference call. After I came up with this concept of uncomfortable conversations with a black man, I went to my team of trusted advisors. Hey, I have this concept and I want to turn it into a book. Their response, well, Emmanuel, the market is too saturated for books like that. So unfortunately, I just don't think it's a great idea. I ignored them and I went on anyway. And two New York Times bestsellers, including a number one <laughs> New York Times bestseller later, I'm sitting down again with you, Scott, for my third Oprah book. I say all that to say, when you're doing something illogical in your journey and destiny towards greatness, you're gonna have to put your earmuffs on y'all because people are going to think what you are doing and where you are going is crazy and that is okay. Emmanuel, to that point in the book, you write, so I made an illogical decision and bet on myself. I took a risk. I mean, that seems like that should be a logical point of view, but how many of us are scared, threatened? Our advisors tell us, yeah, don't do that. Do this instead. That's crazy. This is going to happen. Do this. This is such a simple but profound statement. So I made an illogical decision and bet on myself. Why do you think so many of us think betting on ourselves is a risk. I love, love, love that question. Oh my God, I love it. I'll say it's why, here's why. Because we are afraid of other people's fears. Scott, mortuous cuis phobia, the fear of ketchup. Mortuous cuis phobia, the fear of ketchup. This is a true thing and I have a true story. I was in sixth grade, I'm eating a burger at my friend's house. Sixth grade, burger, my friend's house. Older brother walks in, his older brother's in ninth grade. His older brother thrusts something at the table. My friend scurries behind the couch and gets into the fetal position. I look at my friend and after comforting and consoling him, I run to the table to say, what in the world did his older brother just throw on this table that sent my friend running? It was a ketchup packet. I bust the packet open and I started munching on my fries. I learned a lesson that day, Scott. We got to stop being afraid of other people's fears. Imagine how irrational it would have been if I would have hid behind this couch too in fear of gotcha. As silly as this story might seem, it's what so many of us do. I, I don't want to get into a relationship because my friend is afraid of commitment. I don't want to break up. I've heard how tough it is being single, so I'm going to stay in this toxic relationship. Well, my parents have never left the suburb of Philadelphia, so why would I leave? I've been in Austin, Texas my whole life, and my friends refuse to leave. I'm not going to leave. We're afraid of other people's fears, not even our own fears. But I'll say it like this, and Will Smith said it in his recent book, which is phenomenal. I will paraphrase. 
When someone else gives you their advice, it is just that, it is theirs. You and now are a unique occurrence of which you are the best measure for success. You and now are a unique occurrence, never happened before, of which you are the best measure of success. So why in the world do we take other people's advice so often? And more importantly, why are we afraid of other people's fears? To me, Scott, that's why we're afraid of betting on ourselves because we look at other people's fears and other people's failures and we assume we will fail as well. Emmanuel, speaking of your dear friend, Will Smith, we have been chasing him for months to try to give him the same platform that we've given you. So put a good word in there for me, will you? Uh, done and done. I'll call you. I like it, man. Done and done. Uh, Emmanuel, one of the most visceral memories I have of your book, Uncomfortable Conversation with a Black Man, is a story you told about um, Kim Kardashian and her braids and the Bo Derek story. And I want you to recreate that story because there's a little bit of correlation to a story you share in The Logical about a guy named Harry, is it Anslinger? If I'm saying Anslinger, Anslinger. yeah. And they're not, they're not the exact story, but they have some similarities. Would you do me a favor and the audience a favor? Would you just recreate the learning from the Kim Kardashian story? And to what extent are there some similar but perhaps different lessons that you learned from Harry Anslinger? I'm um, synthesizing these two points. Audience, buckle up. So Kim Kardashian, she attributed braids, a braided hairstyle to uh, an actress, Bo Derek. She called them Bo Derek braids, a white woman. However, these braids are truly found from West Africa. They're called Fulani braids. And so that was cultural appropriation in that moment. The cultural appropriation is an aside, but there was a learning period there. Kim Kardashian attributing these Fulani braids to Bo Derek when it was truly a West African origin thing. As it pertains to Harry Anslinger, um, it's a long story of which I will synthesize. I, I made a statement regarding the smoking of marijuana uh, to which so many people on social media were outraged. Emmanuel, look up how marijuana and it being outlawed is ridiculous. Look up marijuana, it needs to be legalized. Look up all these things. Based on social media, I had to choose at that point, point in time to educate myself. Harry Anslinger in 1937 was the head of the Federal Bureau of Narcotics, the original head of the Federal Bureau of Narcotics. Harry Anslinger, because of his disdain for black people, attributed marijuana to some of the most heinous crimes committed in the country. And that is how he got marijuana outlawed, outlawed in the Marijuana Tax Act. I believe that it was what it was. So what Harry Anslinger did, and y'all look up this story, it is truly mind blowing. One of the most mind blowing things you will ever hear and ever read. Harry Anslinger created something called the Gore Files. The Gore Files are 200 uh, of the most heinous crimes, sexual crimes, violent crimes, predatorial crimes. And he attributed all of them to marijuana. So Harry Anslinger would do something like this. Emmanuel Acho murdered the entirety of his family and, uh, and left no one alive except himself, and he was caught smoking a joint. The entirety of that story was actually true. It was actually a police report, but Harry Anslinger added the marijuana usage, and he attributed the murders to marijuana usage, telling you all this to say he used these gore files to get marijuana outlawed because Harry Anslinger said, and I quote, Reefer causes white women to seek sexual relations with black men, close quote. So all of that being said, I looked up Harry Anslinger because of the uh, backlash I received on social media educating myself. And I think Scott synthesizing those points is probably the similarity between Kim Kardashian because of the out cry and backlash she received educating herself. If I believe that's the correlation, yeah. um, but those are the two stories. That's exactly right. I, I found it, there's some correlation because I'm guessing Kim Kardashian has learned a lot. I don't know her personally, perhaps you do, but I'm guessing she learned a lot about doing a little bit of research behind you know, why she does certain, certain things because she's in the public eye. And what I found intriguing about your story and the similarity was you showed some vulnerability in the book that in fact you took off your earmuffs and you looked yeah. through all of the thousands of comments, some quite vitriolic, and you found yes. one that was quite simple where someone I don't think you even knew and they said, hey, look up this story and you chose to do that and you educated yourself and now you are in a better, more contemplative place and probably recognize the power of your words and making certain that you are 
responsible for what you say and educating yourself. I'm guessing there's been a pretty um, a watershed of you recognizing the impact of your words. Yeah, um, you can never be so, never be too prideful to learn. I think the conscious mind is the learning mind and the mind that is not learning is dying. And so I'm always willing to learn. The hard part is there's so much toxicity on social media now that it's hard to even find and navigate the morsel of truth. Because in order to navigate the morsel of truth, you have to read, Emmanuel, you're an idiot. Emmanuel, I hate you. Emmanuel, just shut up. Emmanuel, this is ridiculous just for you to find a morsel of truth. Now, thankfully, I kept searching and searching, and it was a Dr. Benicia Williams, a doctor in physical therapy, who told me about the benefits of uh, CBD, not to be confused with THC. Remember, marijuana, I believe, has three components, CBD, THC, and there's another component. CBD is not a psychoactive component, whereas THC is a psychoactive component. I, on a Saturday, called this Dr. Benicia Williams. I told her to send me her PowerPoint presentation, and I spent the entire Saturday afternoon researching different components of marijuana when full transparency, I've never smoked weed a day in my life but never being too prideful to learn. I think we all have to have a willingness to learn and we all have to have a willingness to commit ourselves to ideas we once at one point in time would have thought irrational. Scott, that's what I had to do with realizing goals are dumb. Everybody in a mama believes goals are the way to go. Harvard study says that the 97% of people that don't set goals, I believe, work for the 3% of people who do. Something along those lines, I might be butchering that statistic, but there's a 3%, 97% correlation between those that set goals and those who don't. But I said, you know what? That doesn't work for me. I think goals are dumb. And I dedicated a chapter to that belief. And I also dedicated four years of my life to getting a master's degree in sports psychology to further examining that belief. I mean, I know our time is tight. Uh, I've not rehearsed this next question. So everyone, pre forgive me if I butcher it. My intent is to have you give advice to everyone on this topic. Um, you are a, fun, a, a formidable person, right? Um, in terms of your stature, you are an NFL linebacker. You are a handsome guy. You have a very charismatic personality. You are extraordinarily well-educated. You are a multi-New York Times number one best-selling author, soon to be additional New York Times best-selling author. You are a celebrity. You are a social media influencer. You are a TV personality from your time on The Bachelor and ESPN and other programs. But you also in the book talk about how you've built these skills. You weren't always such an eloquent speaker. You built a cadence. You built your vocabulary. You aggregated styles from other people that you saw and saw their success and liked. To, so if you look at you from the average person like me, you're hard to identify with, right? I, I find you inspiring and contagious, but you're, 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 you're superhuman in many aspects. Dispel that to me. I'm guessing your success has really come from having great mentors, but also you've worked hard and you've disciplined yourself. You've put on earmuffs. You've listened when, need, when, when needed. What's the key to your success, Ben? Simply put, being illogical. But let me break this down and not be cheesy. June 9th, 2020, I had just finished doing a, a conversation with Oprah on Apple TV. It was called The Oprah Conversation, and it met uncomfortable conversations with a black man. I'm exhausted, Scott. I'm sitting in the green room after, literally tired. I just finished talking for two hours in front of Oprah. So I'm emotionally taxed, and I'm vocally taxed. Oprah's right-hand woman, Terry, runs into the office. Emmanuel, great job, great job. But... Oprah called you and you missed her call. I rush into my pocket, I look at my phone, uh-oh. I instantly go call Oprah back. Oprah picks up with a very giddy voice. She says this, you have the thing, my friend, you have the thing. And coming from someone who had the thing and has the thing, you, my friend, you have the thing. My jaw hit the ground. What is the thing? She said, you have an ability to speak hard truths and people still want to hear them. Why am I telling the story? because I fervently believe, Scott, that everybody has the thing. My thing is I just happen to be a gifted speaker, but everybody is gifted at something. You might be a phenomenal empath. You might be a gifted listener. You might be a great lover of people. 
You might be a great athlete. You might be a great painter. You might be a phenomenal entrepreneur. You might be a great task worker. Everybody has the thing, but it takes being illogical to maximize your thing. I promise I am no more gifted than the next woman and I am no more gifted than the next man. I have simply chosen to live an illogical life and say, you know what? I'm not going to let these boundaries that other people have set before me stand in my way. Be illogical. Take the chance. Life is short and tomorrow is not promised. Do not live a half-filled life, leaving yourself to wonder, what if? Just go do it. The book is Illogical, Saying Yes to a Life Without Limits, out today by Emmanuel Acho, soon to be a bestseller on every list there is, sir. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you of all the TV programs, radio programs, and podcasts. You have few you can do because your time is limited. Thank you for joining us today. We appreciate you. It's always a pleasure, my friend. Until next time, until the next book. And tell your good friend, Will Smith, we said hello. <laughs> 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 Thanks for joining us today. Emmanuel Acho, a master mentor in volume three, done and done was the quote. I hope you've enjoyed this. This book is, is fantastic. It is life-changing. It's one of my two favorite books in the last year out today. Strongly encourage you to buy this book for you, your family, perhaps your children, brothers and sisters. It's, it's a great read. Oh, what a generous author. We'll see you back here next week for a new conversation on leadership.